Welcome to the TaxCast from the Tax Justice Network. Around 20 minutes each month of news, scandal and analysis you won't find anywhere else. With me, Naomi Fowler. The TaxCast is available to everyone on www.tackletaxhavens.com. It's also on the Tax Justice Network's website, www.taxjustice.net forward slash taxcast. You can subscribe to our RSS feed, to the Tax Justice Network's YouTube channel, email me on naomi at taxjustice.net, look for us on iTunes, or find us on a radio station near you. Coming up later, we look at a global banking industry that's out of control. And we ask, just what does a bank have to do these days to lose its licence? This month on the TaxCast, we'll be focusing on the story dominating all others at the moment. We'll be looking at the fallout from the massive data leak from British bank HSBC by whistleblower Hervey Falciani. He's exposed criminal behaviour and the secret Swiss bank accounts of more than 100,000 clients in over 200 countries. I'm, I'm pissed of seeing people suffering where it is not required, you know. I'm pissed of seeing so many injures behaviours. That's whistleblower Hervey Falciani, and he says there's plenty more still to come out. Work on analysing one million new bits of data starting soon. Apparently a major oil company could be the next to feel the heat. And so HSBC Bank now faces criminal investigations in Argentina, Belgium, France, possibly in the United States, and even in Switzerland. But so far... Not in the UK. And here's a fun fact for you. More people have been arrested for leaking data from Swiss banks than have been prosecuted by the UK government for hiding money in Swiss banks. Now we're wondering at the Tax Justice Network, where's the rush by UK politicians to introduce emergency protection for whistleblowers like Falciani? And how about some financial incentives to expose corruption? There are signs everywhere of HSBC pressure. In the United States, the bank stopped donating money to US politicians in the weeks before the revelations went viral. And the appointment of Loretta Lynch, Barack Obama's nominee for Attorney General, seemed like a done deal. But now politicians are questioning again the settlement she agreed with HSBC a few years back when it admitted to facilitating money laundering by Mexican drug cartels and helping clients dodge US sanctions. Back in the UK, the chief political commentator of a major British newspaper, The Telegraph, has resigned in protest at the lack of coverage. HSBC's advertising revenue was apparently more important, and the owners of the paper have their own long tax haven history. HSBC also put its advertising on hold with another British newspaper about to publish a series of stories about them. The UK's tax authority says they weren't asleep at the wheel when Falciani tried to pass his data to them back in 2008. Former HSBC boss Lord Green joined the British government as trade minister even after the data was first leaked. He's still refusing to make any comment. And finally, it so happens that HSBC owns lots of so-called UK infrastructure assets. That's things like schools and hospitals. They own them offshore, of course, by a private finance initiative special purpose vehicle shell companies registered in the tax havens of Guernsey and Luxembourg. Now we're going to talk to John Christensen of the Tax Justice Network for his take on this month. OK, John, it's been an incredible couple of weeks for tax justice, hasn't it? I mean, talk about the chickens coming home to roost. We've had so many clear demonstrations of the capture of democracy and nation states and systematic criminal behaviour by the finance sector that the Tax Justice Network's been warning about for years. And we just don't have enough time to go into them all here, do we? But we'll talk about the HSBC leaks in a minute. But I just want to ask you, first of all, about the British opposition leader Ed Miliband's threat to Britain's crown dependencies and overseas territories, the kind of outer ring of the UK tax havens or secrecy jurisdictions, places like uh, Bermuda, British Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, Jersey, Guernsey, the Isle of Man. Um, the British government asked them politely a while back um, 
something along the lines of, I say, chaps, would you mind awfully if we ask you to uh, create registers of beneficial owners? Um, and so now the uh, opposition leader, it seems, he's realised that it was all a bit pathetic. And, uh, and, it, and not only that, I suppose, but it's a bit of a boat winner. And so he's written to the lot of them, giving them six months to create these registers of real owners of companies and accounts. That's six months, assuming that his party gets elected into government. Uh, and we have an election in in Britain later this year. Basically, these places have said, uh, no, <laughs> we're not going to cooperate. Well, this is extraordinary. And I think it shows just how corrupt the uh, offshore financial services industry have become. They were asked by the Prime Minister to consult across the islands to find out whether there was support to create public registries of beneficial ownership. And golly gosh, back they come after a few months of talking with the lawyers and the banks and the accounting firms that run the offshore secrecy. And they've said, no, you know, we really don't think it's such a good idea to be transparent because, you know, we might be put out of business. So uh, not surprisingly, these islands, which don't have much to sell apart from secrecy, are going to not cooperate. And that's what they've come back to the Prime Minister. And rather than say, um, well, if you don't cooperate, we'll take immediate action because I'm the Prime Minister and I'm acting on behalf of the, the Queen. And the Queen is the head of state of all of these territories. And therefore, we have the power to take action. The Prime Minister said, oh, oh dear, well, if that's the case, there's nothing we can do. Um, now, the leader of the opposition in the run-up to the election has seen the possibility for no doubt, um, winning um, some support, but but also taking action here. He's written to the islands saying, you must now, within the next six months, introduce these registries, or we will push for you to be blacklisted. But why push for blacklisting when, if he's elected to become the Prime Minister, Ed Miliband will actually have the power and the responsibility to take direct action, because the UK government can intervene directly and impose public registries on all of the overseas territories. And if they're not willing to cooperate, he can intervene. There's no question about it. British governments in the past have intervened, have required legislative measures, have in fact imposed direct rule on the Turks and Caicos Island when their government fell because of corruption just a few years ago. So there's, there's precedent of the government in the United Kingdom engaging directly and imposing measures where it sees fit. And if it fails to do that, then it is not acting responsibly at the international level. Right. And if we look at the OECD blacklisting, I mean, actually, it sounds tough, but it's not much of a threat, is it? <laughs> uh, it's not really going to have them quaking in their shoes. Um, Gibraltar's chief minister has made a statement saying the standards that apply in respect of financial services and their provision from Gibraltar are exactly the same standards that apply in respect of London, in respect of Frankfurt and the rest of the EU. And I'm just wondering, you know, there are reasons why the British government and people that might be elected to the British government might not want to be so forceful. And that might be one of the reasons. Well, I suspect the real reason why the British government doesn't want to be forceful is precisely because they know that, that its overseas territories and the City of London have shockingly low standards and are doing very good business out of handling corrupt money and illicit financial flows and supporting tax evasion. And they don't actually want to uh, interfere with that because of the fierce lobbying, the very power of the, the, the banking lobby in the City of London. And, and for the Chief Minister of Gibraltar to say that, well, of course, technically he's probably correct, but that reflects the shockingly poor standards of most of the offshore financial centres, whether it's London or Frankfurt or New York. The standards are extremely poor, and his comment simply reflects the, the weak global standards that apply and frankly, the weakness of the international agencies, and that includes the OECD, which have had responsibility for decades to handle this. And just one final word about the OECD blacklisting. When they came forward with a blacklisting at the beginning of last decade, and that blacklist was very quickly dispensed with because, you know, by strange coincidence, I'm sure nothing more than that, most of the OECD countries weren't included on that blacklist. And when later on they came up with a blacklist in 2009, yes, there were a few OECD countries that were listed initially on the black and grey list, but they very rapidly moved on to the white list. And, and the whole process rapidly became so uh, tarnished and so, frankly, so ridiculous that no one pays any attention to the OECD blacklist any longer. 
but I think it reflects the fact that the OECD is quite simply unsuitable to, to take action in this area. OK, let's talk about HSBC Bank. So there's been so much going on with this bank, one of the world's largest, a British bank, the leaks of accounts from uh, uh, more than 100,000 clients in 203 countries from the whistleblower Hervé Falciani go right back to 2007. It's not really new news, the people that have been around in this area watching what's been going on here. But uh, let's look at... Um, what's actually going on as a result of these leaks, which are now much wider in the public domain. Uh, HSBC is facing now criminal investigations in Argentina, Belgium, France and the US, I think. And even the Swiss prosecutors just searched Switzerland's HSBC branch. In the UK, so far, nothing. Oh, in the UK... um Slightly predictably, there's absolutely no sign whatsoever that the government wishes to intervene. In fact, they've said they do not wish to intervene. And one has to ask this big question, uh, why not? Um, Let's remember, by the way, contextually, HSBC has not just been involved in promoting tax evasion schemes to its clients through its, its Geneva branch. It's also been involved in laundering drugs money in the United States and Mexico, It's also been involved in the rigging of the LIBOR market, that is the interest-setting market in London. It's been involved in currency exchange manipulations. In other words, there is a pattern of criminal behaviour. That pattern reflects the fact that there is clearly a laxity of control at the top end. And it doesn't help, it doesn't pass the proverbial sniff test that the former group chairman of HSBC and the the man who was chief executive of its activities in Geneva at the time when all of these things were going on became a government minister in the current coalition government. No longer a minister but he was a minister at that time and clearly very influential and well connected to the government and I think this is part of the, the, the wider problem of Britain's finance curse, the extent to which it's dependent upon the City of London and the City of London has captured its political processes. And that extends also to the media uh, and and, and newspaper coverage because we also have this newspaper scandal that's emerged in the last few days where one of Britain's leading newspapers has been accused by its own political commentator of not covering the HSBC story for fear of losing advertising revenue. And this is all part and parcel of this finance curse. What should happen to protect whistleblowers like Antoine Deltour and Hervé Falciani, who are acting, after all, in the public interest? If you compare and look at the situation in the United States, whistleblowers can get even up to 30% of the tax proceeds resulting from information they give on tax issues in their workplaces. Uh, I think the US system, 30%, is is a very, very strong incentive. Uh, We could perhaps... uh, be a little bit more modest in, in, in the European Union or in other countries, but I think there is a strong case for providing a financial incentive to support whistleblowers. These people are acting in the public interest, very possibly putting them into a position where they might be facing prosecution, uh, and they do genuinely run the risk of losing both their careers and their livelihoods. Thanks, John. John Christensen of the Tax Justice Network. Interesting times. Now it's time for the TaxCast special feature. And this month, the TaxCast asks, just what does a bank have to do to lose its licence? Here's the now infamous whistleblower Hervé Falciani talking to NDTV in India about how his HSBC leaks go far beyond HSBC. You can follow the lead and you can expose many, many banks. So from one single bank, you can have hundreds more banks exposed if you just put the efforts required. Any citizen need to understand clearly that you have an industry to manage black money, criminalizing people like me, criminalizing information, facts. They Mm. don't want investigation to happen. Even when banks are investigated, history shows us they don't need to worry too much about the consequences because there aren't that many. I asked the Tax Justice Network's Nick Shackson, author of Treasure Islands, what the HSBC scandal tells us. 
this reveals that places such as the United Kingdom have been so substantially captured by offshore players. And it really gets to the heart of what the offshore tax haven business model is. The, the business model of a tax haven, and I've put the United Kingdom firmly in this category, is all these wealthy people can come to London, we won't investigate you too much, we won't look probe into your Swiss bank accounts, and this is also very substantially linked to corporations being able to avoid tax. And regulatory laxity is saying to you know all these financial institutions around the world, come to London, we're going to turn a blind eye if you want to play fast and loose with, with some other country's financial regulation. Right, and according to former US bank regulator Bill Black, the kind of success of the City of London, if you want to call it that, is because it won the regulatory race to the bottom. And I'm quoting here, it's the worst vector for the epidemic of sleaze led by our most elite bankers. Well, Bill Black is absolutely right. I've always seen the United Kingdom as the most important player in the kind of race to the bottom on global financial regulation. Of course, other financial centres have been very important too, but United Kingdom and New York have been the kind of the two top dogs in terms of international financial centres for many years. And there's been this kind of race going on between them. If you look at the history of deregulation in the United States, you will see that London is there in the background all the time. There's this kind of race to the bottom being going on since about the 1960s when the euro dollar market really started growing. Um, the euro dollar market was a kind of deregulated market that was incubated in London and then exploded around the world. US banks have been able to escape financial regulation, have been able to escape um, all the sort of aspects of the New Deal that were put in place after the 1930s and the, the Great Depression. And they've been able to come to London and do stuff in London they've not been, not been allowed to do at home, growing very, very fast in the process, growing politically and economically, these, these large institutions from Wall Street. And then they come back to New York and they say, hey, look, we can do all this stuff in London. You, you've got to deregulate, otherwise we're all going to relocate there. And I, I remember there was a lobbying document in January 2007 put about by Michael Bloomberg and Charles Schumer, two top US politicians. It was called New York in danger of losing status as world financial centre within 10 years without major shift in regulation and policy. And it was an aggressive document saying you've got to deregulate everything. And that document mentioned London more than 130 times. In not a very long document, it's astonishing how, how powerful London has been in the minds of US regulators. And of course, this has been the case for many jurisdictions around the world. When banks get caught out, they tend to make public statements about the new procedures they've put in place since their crimes occurred. HSBC is now telling us it's fundamentally changed since the times Hervé Falciani's leaks refer to. But Tax Justice Network advisor, economist and asset recovery specialist Jim Henry is pretty sceptical. It's kind of like you know, the asbestos problem for the tobacco industry. <laughs> it's not just one firm or the exploitation of one jurisdiction. You know, it's multiple jurisdictions, it's operating on a global basis, and it's basically an industry out of control. The behavior of these institutions over time is clear. It's reprehensible. And they keep doing it over and over again. And every time they come back and say, we've changed. You know, there's just no evidence for that. OK, Jim, and you should know because you've been monitoring this area for a long time, haven't you? Tell us about your latest research on crimes and fines in the financial sector. Well, from 1998 to 2014, I compiled a, a database of every conceivable financial fine, penalty, order of disgorgement of profits, restitution, and also the private settlements. And I looked at 14 different crimes everything from rigging LIBOR and foreign exchange rates to mortgage fraud and money laundering and tax evasion and securities fraud to uh, illegal foreclosures, bribery. There were about 930 such offenses in this 16-year period. Now that we know about. But anyway, what we find is about 655 such infractions uh, by the top 22 global institutions and a grand total of $246.1 billion of penalties, including uh, settlements and fines, have been levied against these top 22 institutions. 
Right, and I realise that your data isn't about who's doing the most crime, because obviously we don't know that, but this is about which international players got caught and basically had to cough up the most over the time period you've looked at, right? So could you give us a kind of a roll call then, if you would, of who's who in terms of the size of banking fines by the billion? Yeah, Bank America, 73 Chase, 39, Citibank, 24, UBS, 14, Wells Fargo, 11, BNP, 9, uh, Deutsche Bank, 7, Credit Suisse, 6.8, RBS, Royal Bank of Scotland, 6.7, Lloyd, 6.3, and then finally we get down to HSBC, 5.2. I would say the the top uh, 10 banks accounted for more than half of the total. So, you know, this is kind of an interesting context for the whole HSBC. The big picture is that a lot of these big institutions have been doing the same damn thing, and they've been all engaged in multiple kinds of financial crime. And I know you've identified 51 regulatory agencies in 35 countries, and the overwhelming majority of the data you've collected, Jim, shows the country where the most prosecutions or settlements with financial institutions have taken place is the United States. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, a good 90% pertains to fines implemented or lawsuits settled by U.S. regulators or by U.S. private investors. It's not surprising to me that that would be the case for private investors in the U.S. is a big capital market, but I'm a little bit surprised that European regulators have not been more aggressive. If they're not going to use fines, then what are they doing? Right, and apparently the European Union didn't even fine its banks until recently. But even though the United States is more active in terms of enforcement and they're fining banks much more than anyone else seems to be, the criminality just seems to keep on coming. Our regulatory system is basically not preventive. It isn't effective, partly because we're not sending people to jail. So the worst thing that can happen to you as a CEO of HSBC is really to retire and move on and then have to face the press five years down the road if you're caught. You know, we just don't have any instance you can point to during this period when any of the people running these criminal enterprises have had to go to jail or experience any fines themselves personally, or even clawbacks of their executive compensation. I think what they learned from this experience is not only that in any given year, the penalties are small as a fraction of cash flow or book earnings or any measure of profitability, but that, even more important, it takes such a long time under the current regulatory system to catch these these kinds of crimes and prosecute them effectively across borders The fines are going to come at some distant point in the future. You as the senior executive may not even be around. Your stock options will already have appreciated. You know, you can move on to become minister of trade in the uh, Cameron government. (laughs) (laughs) Jim's talking there about the former HSBC boss, Lord Green, invited to join the British government. And it's one of many examples of the revolving door between government and the finance sector, not just in the United Kingdom, but around the world. As a result of Falciani's leaks, HSBC is now facing criminal investigations in Argentina, Belgium, France and the United States. Even the Swiss don't feel they can ignore it, and Switzerland's HSBC branch has just been searched by the Swiss prosecutor. But in Britain, so far... There's no such investigation. Nick Shackson, it's hard not to come to the conclusion that HSBC and rich tax dodgers, whether individual or corporations, enjoy a certain degree of protection from the British government. Absolutely. I mean, HSBC facilitating tax evasion in Switzerland and many other things, as it happens, is just a classic example of that. I mean, one of the statistics that really struck me recently in relation to the HSBC scandal is a little statistic that showed that in the UK in the last year or so, the number of people who've been prosecuted for not paying their television licence is is around 200,000 people. Look at the number of people who have been prosecuted under the HSBC scandal. The the UK tax authorities were given 6,800 names in 2010. That's five years ago. The number of people prosecuted as a result of that, just one. I remember talking to a 
a former UK member of the of, of the financial police who who said he was giving a presentation at a conference of bankers a few years ago and he was talking about London and money laundering and all these kinds of things and he sat down and a senior banker turned to him and said if you think that this government is going to prosecute anyone of my class you've got another thought coming and back in the United States, bankers have good reason to feel untouchable too. Yes, banks there have paid out the largest ever fines and settlements in recent years. Jim Henry still refers to those as parking tickets. But he points out the Department of Justice used to come down a lot harder on banks. Under the first Bush administration from 1988 to 1992, we had the savings and loan crisis. It was about 170th the size of the global financial crisis, 2008. But during that period, the first Bush administration actually had a tough Department of Justice, and they went after bank fraud with a vengeance. They sent 880 bankers to jail during that period. So, Jim, what's changed since then, do you think? What's changed is the political influence of the banking lobby and their enormous role of money in our political system. That has escalated dramatically. And also you have the big banks now have, whereas in the 1990, the top four institutions had a 15% market share. They now have a 50% market share. They are playing in virtually every financial market, investment banking as well as uh, commercial banking. I don't see any substitute for having an organized tax justice and bank reform movement. There's a political case to be made for reducing their influence by breaking them up, that they're basically too big to regulate. Credit Suisse's management team regrets very deeply that despite the industry-leading compliance measures we put in place, we had some Swiss-based private bankers who appear to have violated U.S. law. That's Credit Suisse in the hot seat, a very public one actually, after pleading guilty of conspiracy to assist U.S. taxpayers in filing false tax returns. Normally, after a criminal conviction, you might think that a fine's just the start of it and the government might just consider taking away its licence, at least to practice in some areas of banking. But what usually happens is the United States' Department of Labour just lets banks off with a waiver. It's quietly been doing that for 23 other firms on previous occasions. But this time was a bit different because, for the first time in history, campaigners forced the authorities to hold the hearing in public. Jim Henry was there as a witness representing the Tax Justice Network. You know, at the end of the day, Credit Suisse ought to be pretty happy with this. It looks like they're probably going to give them an exemption, but it's going to have conditions on it. So our goal is really to make it as unpleasant as possible for Credit Suisse so they would realize that this kind of behavior had reputational costs and they wouldn't just be able to count on the administration's discretion. You know, in the backdoor channels of influence that they've been able to use in the past. So, you know, yeah, this is a little bit more than they bargained for, and I think it hasn't been that pleasant for them. We still don't know the outcome for Credit Suisse. They probably won't lose their licence. But a precedent has been set now for future hearings to be held in public, not behind closed doors. But without meaningful reform and proper enforcement, there's still really not much incentive for banks and the finance industry to follow the law. We need strong public pressure on governments to stop their unhealthy relationships with their finance sectors. You've been listening to the TaxCast from the Tax Justice Network. We'll be back next month. Thank you.